And now we're moving to keynote session number five. Our speaker today is Mr. Bill Lett. He is the Managing Director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship and a Senior Lecturer at MIT Sloan School for Management. He started his career with 11 years IBM, culminating in being named a prestigious MIT Sloan Fellow in 1993. Upon graduating in 1994, Bill became a serial entrepreneur running two MIT spinouts, one of which is Sensible Technologies, which earned a place in Time Magazine's list of 500 fastest growing private companies. With a presence in over 20 countries, Sensible also won over two dozen awards and has been featured in Fortune Magazine, Business Week, and Wall Street Journal, and many other publications for its innovative products and strong business foundation. Let's welcome Mr. Ouellette. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is this turned on? Can you hear me? Okay. The first question I have is, how can you have an all Chinese event and serve pizza? <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> So uh, yeah, my name is Bill Allett. I'm, um, I'm an academic by accident, and I'm an entrepreneur by design. Um, <laughs> so I, what I want to do is I, I, I want to, first of all, welcome you all to MIT. Um, we are so happy to have you here. What year is this of chief? Is this like the fourth or fifth year? Fourth year. I remember when you started, and you guys were crazy back then. And then you did it, and, and all these people came. And it's really, it's really great to have you all here. So wh where are you all from? I saw BU, what other, what other places are you from? How many of you are from China? No. I know you're from China, but do you go to school in China? No. How many of you go to school in China? Well, welcome, that's very good. What other schools, how many of you are from Xinhua? That's who we have a relationship. Yeah, you're very proud, aren't you? <laughs> What other schools are you from in the United States? Northeastern. Northeastern. Florida. Florida. CMU. Berkeley. Berkeley. Stony Brook. Stony Brook. Boston, University. Boston University. What's that? MIT. MIT, yeah, of course, <laughs> MIT. <laughs> Harvard, yeah. You're the only one here from Harvard, Mitchell. <laughs> This is, if any of you want any guidance on how to do arts and crafts, Mitchell's here from Harvard. He can help you with finger painting. <laughs> All right, so, uh, I don't mention that though. <laughs> it's funny because I, I did, Mitchell's right, I, I went to Harvard and I got an engineering degree from Harvard. And people from MIT think that's just the funniest thing in the world. Um, <laughs> That they don't think Harvard's accredited to give out engineering degrees. <laughs> so they call me a fake engineer. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove that to you here today, okay? So what I wanna talk about, the headline here is that entrepreneurship must be looked at as a profession. We can't just think of it as some kind of interesting thing that's out there that a bunch of crazy people do. Look, today, young people going to uh, universities like Harvard, like Yale, 20% of them want to become entrepreneurs. So, so as many of them want to become entrepreneurs as want to become doctors or lawyers, more than their teachers, and thankfully accountants, and hopefully investment bankers, right? So entrepreneurship is becoming a profession. And we need to start looking at it in that way and not think of it as just some sort of fad. And it's not going to go away because that's where the jobs are. If, if you don't work in an entrepreneurial company, um, in a startup company, is this off and on? Well, you'll be able to hear me anyway. Um, I guarantee you if you have kids, your kids will work in a startup company. They did a study in the United States that between 1980 and 2005, that basically all the 40 million net new jobs that were created were created by startup companies. So, um, this is not going to go away. By the way, you know, it's 20% at places like Harvard and Yale, it's 25, and the people from Canada just told me, Quebec told me, it's up to 33% there. At Georgia Tech, it's over 33%. At MIT, it's 150%, because you have to start more than one company if you're gonna be an entrepreneur. 
If you don't understand the numbers, Mitchell will explain it to you later, all right? <laughs> so I want to talk about what we do. Um, we call disciplined entrepreneurship, but it's much bigger than that, okay? So everybody talks about entrepreneurship. It's this really cool thing, but nobody, you know, kind of, they just gloss over it. But if you're, an, if you're an engineer, the first thing you do as an engineer is what? You define your terms. That's the first lesson you learn. Define your terms. So what does entrepreneurship need? And what I want to tell you is that it's very important, especially for, for people from China, to understand that there's two different types of entrepreneurship. There's what we call SME entrepreneurship. Oops. There's SME entrepreneurship over here. I don't have a pointer here, do I? Um, over here on the left, we have SME entrepreneurship. This means that you have a small company. When you heard in the election Obama and Romney talking about it, Romney was talking about small companies. Small companies are great. It's like your regional hair salon, it's your pizza place, might even be your Chinese you know, restaurant, right? Um, it is a local IT service company. But those companies deal with local demand. When you're talking about the one on the right, innovation driven, they're going after super regional or global demand. There's something in it that makes them much more scalable business. And that thing is called innovation. That thing is called innovation. And innovation is not an invention. Innovation is an invention that someone figured out how to commercialize to produce some real value for someone in the real world. So, so these two, while we refer to them as entrepreneurship, are very, very different. Because on the left, you're taught to be kind of this person who controls everything. On the right, you focus on how do you make a big, scalable company. So on the left, you can be king. On the right, you can be rich. And it's hard to be a rich king. Because <laughs> you're in control on the left. You don't have to split up the equity. On the right, you've got to take outside investors. You've got to split equity up. You've got to recruit people. You've got to think internationally. It's a different game. Both are called entrepreneurship. But what we focus on here is the one on the right. That doesn't mean the one on the left isn't good. It's good. But that's not what we're going to talk about. So let me tell you, entrepreneurship can be taught. There's no, I didn't used to think that it could be. It can be taught. It can be taught. Let me just give you one, you know, two data points. First of all, people say, well, you're, if your parents are entrepreneurs, you're more likely to be an entrepreneur. There's no empirical evidence that supports that. No data supports that. My parents weren't entrepreneurs at all. My brothers and sisters are not entrepreneurs. But if you get put in the right situation, you can become an entrepreneur. And not only when you're put in the right situation, you can become an entrepreneur, you want to become an entrepreneur. The data shows very clearly the more times you do it, the better you get at it. My first company, not successful. Second company, successful. Third company, very, very successful. And that's, that's one data point, but that is reflective of what the, all the data points show you. The more, you'd be, the more you're an entrepreneur, the better you get at it. Now the question, so the question isn't can you learn it, the question isn't why we should learn it, we need to learn it. We need to create new jobs, we, more than anything else, we need to create new jobs. We also need to increase the, the, our economic standards, our living standards, so it's very important. We also need to solve the world's most intractable problems like education, energy, environment, health care. So entrepreneurship is not going away, we need more of it. The question is, how do you teach entrepreneurship? How do you teach entrepreneurship? And about this, there's been a lot of, there's probably a Chinese word for it, but the American word is called bullshit. Um, <laughs> what's the Chinese word, Mitchell? <laughs> I'm sure there are many. <laughs> um, the demand for entrepreneurship has skyrocketed, has skyrocketed, because of this, the, but the, the, the supply of quality entrepreneurship education does not scale very well. It doesn't scale. So probably a lot of you have taken entrepreneurship classes, and I teach an entrepreneurship class in, in a classroom down, right down here, from here. And recent, when it first started, we just had like about 20 people, 40 people in a class. Now it's up to 100 people. 
But it, it's really hard to do that if you don't have a framework because he's working on a, an app to share taxis. She's working on a medical device. He's working on enterprise software. He's working on renewable energies. Somebody else is working on you know, something else. What is there common between those? Well, it's hard to figure it out. It's not as easy as if I stood in this room and taught you Java programming. That is the same for everybody here. If I teach you math, it's the same. If I teach you physics, it's the same. However, in entrepreneurship, it is so contextually, you know, it's, it's so much depends on the context. And, the, and then the other part of it is it's, it's experiential. You can't sit here and learn about entrepreneurship. You have to do it. You have to get mentoring. So the problem here is that it's hard to scale. The other little dirty secret about entrepreneurship is there's not been a lot of scholarly work done about it. This is unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. There has been some, but there's not a lot. And let me explain to you, it's very simple why, is because the goal in academia is to get tenure. And to get tenure, you need to have nice, clean data sets. And if you want nice, clean data sets, go to Procter & Gamble. Go to places that do financing or financial data. They'll have nice, clean data sets. You don't get clean data sets when you go to an entrepreneurial venture. So it's really, really hard. So what's filled in this gap where, where it, demand is taking off and supply isn't keeping up is, is something I call storytelling. And storytelling is basically fake entrepreneurship education. It says, go out there, try hard. Entrepreneurship is like basketball. Be like Jeremy Lin. Get up early in the morning, work hard. Just a whole bunch of BS that you sit there and go, oh, that's great but now how do I implement that? It's good to have the spirit to be an entrepreneur, and, I, and I'm all for that. But giving people the spirit without the skills does not help them. It sends them out into battle to basically be unsuccessful and get their spirit broken. So what we need to do now is to keep the spirit of entrepreneurship that you might get from so some of the storytelling, but supplement it with rigorous skills. And that's what this is all about. So what we look at it is, is it shouldn't be any one person that's the guru of entrepreneurship. That is rubbish. That is rubbish. And if people tell you that, you should reject it. It's, if, if we're going to take this seriously, we have to think of it as a body of knowledge that everybody contributes to. And it's a body of knowledge that people contribute to that's tested. By, by rigorous social scientists to find out what works and what doesn't work. So we need to think of it as being a profession, open source, common language, just like we do about economics, medicine, and other things. And, and it's not a single you know, tool that solves it. It's a toolbox approach. And this is different than what we've seen. If you think back about entrepreneurship over the past 20 years, there's some fad in entrepreneurship that is the answer to entrepreneurship. Let me tell you, that doesn't work. Entrepreneurship is a complicated system where you need lots of different tools to build your entrepreneurial house, just like here. If someone told you, oh, the adjustable wrench is the great new tool, and you say, that's wonderful, that's a new tool, I'm gonna add it to my toolbox. The incentive of people has been to say, no, it's the only tool you need. That's absurd. But in an industry where you can make millions and millions of dollars by getting people to see you as a guru or your tool as being the only tool, there are tremendous incentives to do that. That is wrong. We cannot have a discipline. We can't have a profession of entrepreneurship if we think of it in that faddish way. So here's, here's a whole bunch of books that have been out there, and you might recognize some of them. But they are simply tools that have to be integrated into a more comprehensive toolbox approach. And then they have to be verified by serious academics to make sure that these things are actually real. We're not trying to build a science on anecdotes. Data analysis is not the plural of anecdotes. You get data sets, you analyze it, you see whether it works or not. So what we put together is this, this framework. And this is a framework that you can go through. It pulls from many different things. Where it starts with is not minimum viable product. It doesn't start with pivoting. It starts with this magical thing called a customer. 
because the single necessary and sufficient condition for a business is not a business plan, it's not jargon, it's not some kind of idea, it's a paying customer. So you need to focus on who's your customer and then know everything you can about them and then build your business back from that. This is not something new. This is what Eric Von Hippel, this is what user-driven design has been about for some time. We're just simplifying it, integrating it, bringing it back to the entrepreneurial environment. And then after that, the question now is, okay, now that we know who the customer is, let's stay in inquiry mode. What can we do for that customer? What can we do for that customer? And what can we uniquely do for that customer? And we systematically step, step you through, how do you do that? What are the terms of that? And then all these things are defined in detail. And then we say, this is, the students love that, those two steps. This part they don't like, especially if you're an engineer. It's like, it's a great product, they should just buy it. It doesn't work that way in the real world. There's a decision-making unit, there's a decision-making process about how they're gonna buy that. And you need to analyze that with great rigor because you can have a great product that brings great value and it will fail miserably. See electronic medical records. People, there was a great thing, but what happened was the doctors wouldn't eat the dog food because there were lots of different decision makers. Are you selling the, are you selling the doctors? Are you selling the hospitals? Are you selling the patients? Are you selling the insurance company? You have to systematically go through that. And so we go through the decision making unit, decision making process, and then once you know that, you can start to understand whether this business will make money or not. There's a lot of businesses out there that kind of do nice things or seem to do nice things, but end up losing money hand over fist. Pets.com was one of them. Right now, there's this one called Groupon. It, it, the economics just don't make sense. So before you go and start building a business, you have to understand what's the lifetime value of a new customer that you get in steady state and what's the cost of customer acquisition. And this all steps through that very methodically. And then the last thing is, now let's build the product. How do you build it in a very efficient way? Stefan Tomke did some great work on this, and he goes, you run small experiments to test your hypothesis. It's a scientific method. But now we're, we, we know what to test because we know who our customer is. We know what they want and what value we can bring, and it makes sense for us to make a sustainable business. So all this is kind of a, is a very methodical process. Let me just jump jump through here you can get all this stuff it's a very methodical process to build a company it's not an algorithm to make you successful but it will dramatically increase the odds of success so this is what we're looking to do we're looking to take entrepreneurship and make it much more professional a discipline incorporating all the knowledge that's out there throughout the entire world because we need we need high quality entrepreneurship I'll just say that we look at this now and we are broadening out our scope even more. What I just went through, Disciplined Entrepreneurship, the book, if you get it, take the, the online courses, you'll see it's a very important part of entrepreneurship. How do you build, how do you design and build a product? But there are a lot of other elements up here that go around it that we need to systematically um, develop a body of knowledge about as well. And that's what we're doing here. We're doing it places like Xinhua. We're doing it with other places like Harvard, Stanford. Anybody else will work on it. This is way too important a field to try to have any one place do it. The world needs more entrepreneurship. So let me just say, in, in, in kind of closing here, entrepreneurship is not a spectator sport. Entrepreneurship, you have to get out there, try it, and do it, and iterate, and get better and better at it. You will not learning, learn simply by sitting on, on the sidelines. Nor will you learn just by getting in there and smashing your head in day in, day out. We have to have some frameworks and, and experiential learning going back and forth. And that's what we're developing here at MIT. So it's all, all about focus, too. When you're an entrepreneur, you don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of resources. You have to decide. I'm doing this, and when you decide to do this, that means you're not doing other things, and you have to deselect the other things that you're not going to do. That's why we put the word discipline next to entrepreneurship. And I remember when I first started, people said, those two things are like totally contradictory, but they're not. When you see a great entrepreneur, next time you see a great entrepreneur, look, and you'll see someone 
who's kind of creative. They have the spirit of a pirate, but they have the execution skills of a Navy SEAL simultaneously. And that's what it is. That's discipline, and then entrepreneurship is that kind of creative irreverence. So here's the book. Here's the online toolbox. Um, the book is in Chinese. Has anyone gotten the book in Chinese yet? It is out there in orthodox, and it's out there in orthodox and simplified Chinese as well. Um, and this is the online class in December. This one will be coming back out again. It's, we put it out kind of quickly to see what would happen, and we got 20,000 people who were like, oh my God, but let's see where it goes down to, because MOOCs go down. It went up to 55,000 before they cut it off. And then it's coming back out in December with 101 and 102. And I would suggest that's a very good uh, resource for you as well that's completely free. And then this is a course at MIT and the spirit of a pirate and the execution skills of a Navy SEAL. Okay, do we have time for questions? And you could also tweet me if you want to get your questions directly to me at Bill Ouellette, and I will see them here. Questions? You're completely flummoxed by this. <laughs> Yes, just grab the microphone. Sonia Su, you're already on here. Well done. Uh, just a quick question, but I didn't see any actually degrees offered by MIT about entrepreneurship. You only have classes. That's correct. We do not have degrees in entrepreneurship. So, um, yeah. uh, so, so do you think we should? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I've been doing some research about other schools. Uh, it's interesting to say you Michigan, they had an entrepreneurship program last year, but they closed it this year. I don't know what happened. They didn't yeah. tell me. And um, some other schools, they have some maybe different situations, but they don't really have entrepreneurships anymore. So I just don't know how you see um, entrepreneurship as a degree offered versus just classes. So, so first of all, the data for the number of universities that are now teaching entrepreneurship is skyrocketed. It's like over 2,000 teach it. Now, the question is, well, here's what I can tell you. Why, why don't we have a, a, a degree in it? Um, you know, I guess we don't need it, and I don't want people to focus on entrepreneurship at the expense of getting a great education. You know, there's this guy, Peter Thiel, who says he pays people to drop out of school. Because he says, oh, look at dropouts like Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs. Um, I think that is so wrong, I can't begin to tell you. Because that's like saying to be a great basketball player, all you need to do is be like LeBron James. Um, that's like so remote. For all those people who try to be Mark Zuckerberg and don't get a great education, what happens to them then? You know, Get a great education in engineering, math, science, technology, do all those other things, learning how to be a good citizen and communicate with other people, and then you'll be a great entrepreneur. There's the myth that entrepreneurs are all young. That's rubbish. The, the average age of an entrepreneur is 38 years, a founder is 38 years old. I wasn't for a long time. You can do a lot of things. So I, we encourage people who are interested in entrepreneurship to still take a very good course load, and then they work on it over the summer and then when they graduate. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a uh, um, couple questions. The first one I think uh, it's very important for how to make a decision. See, people have uh, ideas you brought mine, yes. and, uh, but you need to take the time to narrow down your ideas. Um, I have my own company for the real estate, but we have, uh, um, I, I remember the first time I go to the counseling, they say, what's your plan? How much you put your advertise? How much you, uh, you do something, you know, how big company you are, something like that? We have uh, brand new, so we don't know, you know, the kind of things, how to put these things together. Yeah. So the first thing is, um, the idea is the most overrated thing in, in, in uh, entrepreneurship. Let me repeat that. The idea is the most overrated thing in entrepreneurship. The process is much more important because you're going to start with an idea and then you're going to iterate and iterate and iterate on it. We have some research going on now that shows how 
just absolutely infrequent it is that the original idea comes up being the final business. What's much more important than the idea is the process. How do you go through to do this? And that's what we're trying to show. And I can show you that, if anyone, and the students here, no, if you go to my office, it says people before projects, people before ideas, because I do. So the process is incredibly important. What's even more important than the process is getting a great team, is if you have a great team and you have a good process, the idea will take care of itself. There's so many, pro there's so many opportunities out there to solve problems in the world that, make, that can make money, can create sustainable businesses that I am, I am, much, less, I am much less interested in the idea. So in our, what we do here is we focus on teaching the students how to fish. Not to catch a fish, but how to fish. Because if they understand the process, there are going to be plenty of ideas that they see over their lifetime. And that, that's, the, that's the gold. The gold is here. It's not here in the sense that they know how to do it and the confidence they have to do it. It's not the idea. There's plenty of ideas. Ideas are, are very, as we say in our class, we had someone, our class said, if you talk to someone at a coffee shop for 15 minutes and they steal your idea and beat you in the marketplace, then they deserve to do that because you need to be able to execute so well and have a good team, then you, then you can do that. By the way, the, here's another myth. Everybody thinks that you know, MIT is prolific at starting companies. Uh, it starts almost 1,000 new companies a year. And everybody thinks, oh, that's because of all the technology in the labs. The number of companies that start coming out of the labs here is, is fabulous. It's, it, we have a great technology licensing office. It's about 20 to maybe 30 companies a year. 20 to 30, and I just said uh, MIT alumni start 1,000 companies a year. So less than 3% of the companies started by MIT alumni come out of the labs. What's going on here is not as much a transfer of technology as a transfer of knowledge how to start companies. And that's the goal. Teach them how to fish, let focus less on the fish. Should, do, I, do I have time for one more question? Okay. Well, thank you all. If you have other questions, just, just tweet me. Oh, look at this. You have some. And I will, and I will, and I will answer them in 140 characters. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much.